This is the Rogue Insider Podcast. Yeah. Um, they do that, make it look like they were just having a casual chat in the background. And, what do you think and about they just that lead into it. on an aesthetic level? I actually quite like it. I think it's quite nice. It sounds very human. You get to hear people in their human tone, and it mm-hmm. gives you uh, a point of comparison for how they go with their speech. But anyway, you've been reading up on nationalism recently. That's right. I recently read uh, Yoram Hazoni's book, The Virtue of Nationalism. The virtue of nationalism. I was taught, certainly in the mainstream public schooling, uh, about the dangers of nationalism. Um, that it, it seems to be making a comeback, and I've definitely been curious about it because, from what I understand about it, there's uh, benefits to it. But I don't really know exactly what this book is about. Do you want to tell us a little bit? Sure. So, um, there are few political movements that have come in for more flack than nationalism and it's basically been branded um (laughs) since the end of the second world war the sins that apparently nationalism has committed have been piled on more and more i think that the uh, accusation that nationalism was a core cause of the um, second world war is frankly bunk i think that there's uh, much more important aspects of that um and in fact it was when i was reading roger scruton's book uh how to be a conservative he had a chapter because some of the chapters are the virtues of this and the virtues of that which is a classic philosophical um maneuver where you know where you label something uh the virtue of such and such as to try and present the uh, strong argument for it and that's what Yoram Hazoni has achieved in the virtue of nationalism. He, well, if we roll it back a step and go, what is nationalism first, for those who aren't clear? <laughs> well, it depends who you ask. If you ask the critics, nationalism is a form of bigoted and self-entitled um how would you even refer to it this kind of sinful self-obsession where you don't hold yourself to your own standards your nation is the best and everyone else can go to hell and elitism absolutely and uh, one of the sins that nationalism supposedly commits is that it is uh this exact kind of um, patriotic bigotry that leads to all of these conflicts and uh, all the other kind of horrible outcomes that we see in the world wars and genocides uh, and you know any anything that happens in the international arena um, that is negative someone has routed to nationalism at some point okay well that's the extreme form of nationalism the, the bigotry view what about nationalism as a, like a minimal requirement to be on the nationalist spectrum is that belief in the value of a border i would just the say... idea of a nation at all that you value the idea that your nation is separate from another does that not make you a nationalist to some degree what's the minimum requirement i would argue that the minimum requirement to be considered a nationalist is simply to accept the idea that nations exist okay so that's now, quite a sliding scale yeah and let me make a few little um descriptive points uh and clear up a few definitional issues because it's better to do them now than when we're in the flow later on inside the podcast sure for the purposes of this podcast when i refer to nation i specifically mean the um person the, all of the people that live inside a nation when i refer to state i mean specifically the bureaucratic mechanism that governs the running of that nation state and the term nation state there refers to the union of those two 
things, the people and the bureaucratic part of it, and because I'm sure ethnicity is going to come up, I'm going to use the word ethnos to refer to the primary ethnic group that exists within a particular nation. So that gives us three distinct groups, nation, state and ethnos. And now traditionally those three things are all very correlated with each other. And especially since the end of the Treaty of Westphalia, um, to the, to up until very recently, perhaps the end of the Cold War, the nation and the state have been mapped onto each other with almost 100% uh, coherency. This is the Treaty of Westphalia that uh, ended the wars in Europe? That's right. Um, the Treaty of Westphalia is regarded as being the beginning of the modern nation-state. Interestingly, what the Tre Treaty of Westphalia actually says is that one monarch's claim to being God's representative on earth does not necessarily invalidate another monarch's claim to being God's representative on earth. And so... That removal of that style of competition meant that uh, all monarchs could have their own particular little claims, and therefore, though that in a sense ended the religious wars, um, particularly of the extremely brutal kinds that happened during the Thirty Years' War and the sort of post Lutheran age where uh, Catholicism and the various uh, post-Lutheran Northern European Christianities came to blows. And this was enshrined in, in transnational law? Yes, it was an agreement uh, amongst the major powers of Europe. Possibly one of the greatest achievements <laughs> <laughs> in history, really. It doesn't take much digging into the history of the Thirty Years' War to really come to the conclusion that the Treaty of Westphalia is an amazing achievement. Mm. Okay. Right. So that gives us an understanding of the the nation and the state. And the third one was, was ethnos. That? Ethnos. That's yep. right. Okay. And we know what the minimum is to be classified, uh, just to believe in the value or mm -hmm. to believe in the existence of. Wow. It's it's a low bar. <laughs> it and is a low bar. Do you think the top bar is? <laughs> was it? Do you think that's too low? Would you dispute my <laughs> definition? Um, I think I think it needs to, in order to be qualified as an individual, as a nationalist, then you have to perceive a value in it. Mm. It's rather than just believing in the existence of it, because I can believe that people act as if it is the case, and therefore that is made the case by proxy, by other people's enactment. Um, but as for my own personal value system, perhaps I believe in it happening but don't value it so mm -hmm. i think there's a value measure you have to favor it yeah i think that's fair all right let me adjust up the minimum required to be a nationalist then you have to believe that nations exist and that they have some virtues or some beneficial property yeah a virtue there has to be there has to be a virtue to yep. it which doesn't exactly shift the bar very far but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it adds one more minimal okay. requirement i think it's worthwhile well, I want to understand, by the end of this, how much of a nationalist I am. Because I certainly believe that people around me are um, comprehending of uh, a nation. <laughs> certainly, I, be I believe I live in one. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder to what degree I favour it. Because I think my inclination is likely to be I do favour it. But that just could be a, a bias, because I have lots of advantage I'm living in a very blessed situation mm -hmm. and I want to preserve that. So I wonder, I want to learn, I want to discover. So okay. Well, what is this book that's written, it's talking about the virtues. So this could, this book could actually convince me. Um, well, if you accept Yoram Hazoni's arguments, you will be a nationalist at the end of this podcast. That's my prediction. So let me first make um, a point about something that really changed, uh, that Yoram really changed my mind on. And then let's dig into the book and I'll pull out some quotes that will um, elucidate his core arguments. One of the sins that has been laid at the feet of nationalism is um, colonialism. The idea being that 
because a person believes that their nation is great, therefore that in some way validates uh, conquest and the destruction of other nations and the right to invade them and say, oh, all of your resources are ours and you petty foreigners just don't really understand you know, our glorious mission. You're Entirely a, understandable. Mm, what's really interesting about Yoram Hazoni's um, approach is that he constructs nationalism as a specifically anti-colonial um, approach. He's saying, due to, and I, I believe this is Hazoni's core argument, the Judeo-Christian tradition is one that is specifically rooted in an understanding of the state from the time of, uh, and here we're talking about um, prior to Jesus, so inside the pre-Christian Judaic approach, the state is one in which God says, this is the land that has been allotted to you, only this land, this is your the space for your nation, and you it is not okay for you to expand beyond the uh, area that has been allotted for you. So this is the core point of Hazoni's nationalism, that the that it's right for a nation, a people, to have an area to respect their traditions within, and it is invalid for that people to impose their will. On, and to crush the traditions of other peoples that live around them or anywhere else. And in that sense, it's specifically anti-colonial. Right. Well, when I said before that it's totally an understandable position, if somebody believes in the value of theirs, mm. you know, and they have, a, therefore they probably have a, a prejudice against other cultures which they see as inferior and can therefore draw conclusions and justify a colonial agenda to themselves mm. so in terms of intellectually it's understandable um <laughs> i'm not saying i have a bias one way or the other it's certainly at this point so what's really interesting about this approach is that it appears that hazoni is making the argument that um these colonialist impulses that we have seen are actually um perversions of the original Judeo-Christian inheritance not the fulfilment mm. of it now this plays into the modern political landscape in a really interesting way listeners of our previous podcast will remember that we had a brief moment of discussing liberal internationalism that the liberal internationalist project allows itself intervention in other nations because it believes it has an ethical mandate to do so. Hazoni's argument is that those liberal internationalist impulses are completely false, and that only in a world where nations are able to stick to their own traditions without the interference of other powers can a world be peaceful. And that includes despicable acts. So we, so, in order to have a peaceful world of coherent nationalisms, we have to accept that the traditions and ethics that we have inherited are within the nation state that we live within, and that they are not appropriate to be uh, preached or lectured or enforced onto people who are living within other traditions. That sounds quite appealing. Mm. I like the idea of being able to travel to other nations and then be distinctly different and respectful. Mm. And I think that that resolves the core arguments that people have with the um, nationalism as a malignant force. Well, I'm certainly intimidated by the prospect of another nation with a with a culture significantly different from mine that I maybe find distasteful, as in it would be a country that I might not be inclined to go and visit, um, that that nation grew to such a scale and with such power 
and the people uh, behaved in a way that considered colonial agendas acceptable, then yes, I'm going to find that very threatening. So I'm leaning towards Hazoni's argument against colonialism, mm. certainly. Yeah, so... But then I'm coming from a history of... I'm, I'm, I'm a benefactor from a colonial agenda, though, as well. Mm. What's interesting is that um, Hasni has, uh, is extremely sceptical of European philosophers like Hobbes and Locke, who put forward this contractualist argument that a society exists because we all have this social contract that we sign on to by being born into it. He rejects that, but in some sense, the nationalism that he is proposing seems to mirror it, not because there's a central leviathan that crushes people who step out of line, but rather more that we agree to have our own separate spheres in which um, we get to decide our own actions. One of the things that's interesting about living in the West at this moment is that the West is extremely sceptical of any uh, first-person plural. That even just the idea of a we is enough to raise a kind of a hint of suspicion. As though, um, for example, if I was to say, we New Zealanders, there would be some people in New Zealand who would go, uh, what are you trying to draw me into here? I don't know if I... And, and willing right. to get involved in whatever project you think that you can rope me into. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would never be so bold. <laughs> um, so if you're happy for me to um, give some qu- key quotes from the book and then we can discuss them, how does that sound? Sure. I, just before we go there, uh, if I was to say we about... Other New, we New Zealanders, as if I'm trying to represent that group. Mm. Um, I, I see a bit of crossover in, in other movements because there's a lot of ethnic groups that try and use the we argument or political groups that use a we argument. But on a nation level, it's resisted. Is that a legacy or is that indicative of a weakness of the nation's identity or indicative of, of actually, uh, in addition to that, uh, a result of the atrocities and the, and the distaste and aversion from nationalism on a social level? Well, there's a few things here. One of them is that somehow, and I've no idea how this could have occurred, somehow the German blood guilt that comes from Nazism and the Second World War has been used to tar all supposedly white people, whatever that term means, even though it was almost all of the other European nations that... Or, sorry, nations with a European ethnic heritage, which put a stop to it? Hmm. And well, are there other non-European ethnicity nationalist uh, cultures around? Like well, Chinese, ab- right? Absolutely. I mean, China is a specifically nationalist nation. There's no... In fact, it's an ethnic nationalist nation, to be specific. One cannot become Chinese just by moving to China and living under that state. The ethnicity and the nation the ethnos and the nation and the state are all regarded as being a a whole and look uh india is much the same there's a nationalist party in power there right now what's interesting is that hasney specifically rejects the an ethnicist reading of nationalism but not totally if i've interpreted his only correctly he says And for a nation to be coherent, it requires an undisputed central ethnos to be its driving force. But there is no reason why that central ethnos has to be an exclusionary force. In fact, it's entirely possible for other ethnicities as minor parts to be integrated into the whole of the nation. 
for example, Israel starts with 12 tribes, right? And continues to draw in uh, groups that are willing to be within the uh, sort of primary structure laid down by the central ethnos. Impressive. Mm. Well, where does India lie in that then? Well, they have the same too, don't they? they, they or, or have they got a Hindu bias? The, well, the, the nationalism of India is absolutely a Hindu nationalism. Um, but I don't think that we can interpret India as having a central ethnos because there is just so many peoples that live there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's interesting to consider the possibility of a non-ethnic but bigoted nationalism which is based on a religion rather than on an ethnicity, which is my interpretation of India. I, uh, I may okay, be wrong. Um, uh, we'll just have to clarify bigotry as, is that bigotry in the strict clean sense of just intolerance of specific political uh, states or political opinions or politics? Um, or is it like an, an outward irrational hostility towards those political groups? Well, Indian Hindu nationalism definitely verges into hostility. I mean... Okay. There's regular slaughters of Muslims. Um, distasteful bigotry. That's definitely <laughs> distasteful bigotry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> in fact, the um, prime minister at the moment, the head of the BJP, um, came to power um, partly on the back of, if I recall correctly, I, I may not be right about this, but I think that there was accusations that he had turned a blind eye towards uh, assaults and attacks on Muslims who were living in his um, state that he administered prior to becoming the prime minister. But I should probably shouldn't and talk have, too much and about that. Hasn't he just recently? Yeah, okay. Because recently I'm, passed laws restricting Muslim immigration as well. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, he did. I think there is something about that. He did appoint a Hindu priest to the to. Um, the position of leadership of a state within India, which is the first time that's happened. Mm. Because obviously India inherits its democracy from the um, Westminster tradition. Um, so there's supposed to be a certain amount of separation between uh, religion and bureaucracy, but that has been contravened now. Right. But well, perhaps we digress. Should we go back to these quotes you want to pull out? Let's, let's do that. Um, all right, this one's quite lengthy, so I may bear on your patience a little. <clears throat> Liberal imperialism is not monolithic, of course. When President George H.W. Bush declared the arrival of a new world order after the demise of the communist bloc, he had in mind a world in which America supplies the military might necessary to impose a rule of law emanating from the Security Council of the United Nations. Subsequent American presidents rejected this scheme, preferring a world order based on unilateral American action in consultation with European allies and others. Europeans, on the other hand, have preferred to speak of transnationalism, a view that sees the power of independent nations, America included, as being subordinated to the decisions of international judicial and administrative bodies based in Europe. These disagreements over how the international liberal empire is to be governed are often described as if they are historically novel, but this is hardly so. For the most part, they are simply the reincarnation of thread-worn medieval debates between the emperor and the pope over how the international Catholic empire should be governed, with the role of the emperor being reprised by those, mostly Americans, who insist that authority must be concentrated in Washington, the political and military centre, and the role of the papacy being played by those, mostly European but also many American academics, who see ultimate authority as residing with the highest interpreters of the universal law, namely the judicial institutions of the United Nations and the European Union. That had never no. occurred to me. I, that's a fascinating insight. The idea that this argument about whether or not things should be dictated from a central authority or rather determined by the values of the international community as just being a direct... Um, copy of exactly the arguments that were happening between the Pope and the Papacy. You know the Holy Roman Empire, uh, yeah, the Holy Roman Empire, and 
actual Rome. So it's not just uh, the American Empire agenda um, is an allusion to the old Roman imperial ventures. It's as if the American Empire is fundamentally equivalent. Mm. Yeah, just just repeating old arguments on his own account. Okay, argumentatively, I suppose. Sorry, not equivalent in terms of um, operationally. Mm. So, what is the reason that Hazoni focuses on this? It's because the the those are two varieties of anti-nationalist, um, liberal internationalist maneuver. One which says the central military authority, i.e., Washington, is the one who gets to dictate the moral. Um, compass by which everybody should live out into the world and that's why you know we uh, give Iraq democracy quote unquote um, mm. yeah or alternatively that the international community insofar as much as there is such a thing um, through negotiation of a larger morality uh, gets to decide how everybody should live Whereas the nationalist would say both of those are invalid. Nobody gets to dictate to other people what the morality, what universal morality is. Listeners of our previous podcast will remember me saying that um, the idea of a university, uh, of a morality being universal is an error. Mm. Interestingly, um, if one considers Sam Harris's argument that we can construct a rationalist morality, um, that would have to be one that came to fruition as an absolute morality if one accepts that rationalism is something that's universally achievable. And then, that, so that would be another version of anti-nationalist morality that can be, that's very likely, I would expect, would la- grant itself the license to impose itself on others. Right. For your argument, I certainly find, uh, I find it distasteful the denial of the opportunity for a nation to exert its own its own moral authority over itself. Mm. And it's pretty clear that there's something that feels wrong about that for a nation Indeed, to say to does. another nation, look, this is the right way to live, so pull your boots out. But, and then that also is a sliding scale as well. Because mm. sometimes, you know, you want to disengage perhaps in terms of a trade embargo you could you could disengage from a nation in protest to the way that they treat their people yeah but stepping in to change it well this is one of the core debates in the um early 21st century in international relations was around the responsibility to protect Prior to the invention of the responsibility to protect, the United Nations held that states were independent and it was invalid to cross national boundaries to enforce moral outcomes. After the invention of the responsibility to protect, that uh, barrier had been crossed and then it was valid for states to uh, protect the quote-unquote international community or um, you know, minorities inside other nations by intervening in them so for example right well there might be certain actions that are contraventions of um so it's it's almost like the united nations is representative of a monopolized force Mm -hmm. across the world i mean you have small nations with very low military power that then perform groups within that nation perform atrocities against their own people and aren't restricted or bound by their own many monopolized force within that nation so it behooves the or it's incumbent upon the international community to look at that and assess it so there are conditions where i can see it is appropriate Mm -hmm. 
Well, that argument um, made by the United States for its intervention in Serbia in the 90s is a classic example. The United Nations sent peacekeepers. The peacekeepers were completely ineffective. The Americans said, well, if you're not going to do it, someone has to, so we're going to stop this from happening. Um, I think that was after Srebrenica. Um, similarly, uh, New Zealand chose not to get involved in the Second Iraq War because the United Nations had not um, said this is the right path forward. Or at least that was the excuse that was given. So... I assume, based on Hazoni's arguments, that Hazoni would take the position that American intervention in Serbia in the 90s was invalid. Uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that's only what I can draw from, from the strict application of the idea that national boundaries shouldn't be compromised for the purposes of uh, moral intervention. Okay, and now these are his opening arguments or opening stances against how, or basically saying how nationalism can go wrong. Uh, no, these are his these are his critiques of um, uh, political orders that are not nationalist. Ah, oh. yeah, he's saying that a liberal internationalism is invalid, and the reason why it's invalid is because it doesn't respect uh, the. Uh, doesn't respect the nationalisms that exist. Okay. All right. It allows us to separate our conception of um, nationalist identities and the virtues of nationalism from that whole moralistic intervention quandary. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, okay. um, some IR theorists um, have made crit uh, criticisms of the liberal internationalist order. Um, along similar lines uh, Mearsheimer's book The Great Delusion specifically criticises um, this uh, what he calls liberal dreams this idea that somehow it's possible to militarily impose morality on nations that don't want it and similarly uh, Stephen M. Walsh wrote a book called The Hell of Good Intentions America's foreign policy elite and the decline of US primacy which similarly criticises this uh, U.S. moralistic in, uh, adventurism. All right, okay. So, fascinating. Uh, excluding those, mm -hmm. uh, let's find out if I'm a nationalist or not. Okay. Are you a nationalist? I perceive of uh, a value to nation. I like the idea, as he's outlined, of um, the nation I'm living within being free to you know, explore its own moral quandaries and you know, make its own decisions around how it manages itself and who engages with it and what other cultures and groups engage with it. I like the idea of them all being able to visit. That sounds fine, actually. But I like the idea of us being able to choose. Do you accept so, the validity the of um, the inherited traditions? Uh, even if I don't understand them? Well... Uh, for, well, if they've been utilised historically yeah. and the nation continues to exist, then I would say there must be at least some, perhaps not all, uh, some value mm -hmm. in them. Mm -hmm. I accept that by the le by the legacy of time and the fact that, that our nation has endured over time, that there must be some validity to it. I don't think it's just chance that allows you to secure a nation over time. So mm -hmm. I don't know about all of it. I'm willing to persist with it and can reconsider. Yep. I wouldn't drop it. The reason why I ask is because um, another variety of anti-nationalism is uh, Marxist, right? And it's the reason why Marxist anti-nationalism 
is important is because they the Marxists reject the traditions that have been inherited um, within each of the kind of national boundaries uh, because they regard them all as being inherently exploitative and the result of the war of classes against other classes. And so therefore, because they regard all working people across all nations as being part of the same class and all of the bourgeois across all nations as being part of the same class, then the the in, the national boundaries are invalid because the traditions are invalid, because the traditions are immoral. Whereas if you accept the morality mm. internally, that each tradition has something that is valuable, that it is inherited from the past and that ought to be maintained, and that we have a moral duty to sustain that which has been passed on to us as an inheritance to our children, which I'm pretty sure Hazoni would support, um, then a nation, a nation, a nation state with a strict and strong national boundary is a, I would argue, necessary condition for that to occur. So I'm weighing up in this moment. Uh, my comprehension of the working classes in other nations being the same and that being more important than the um, maintaining of the traditions of my ancestors. Now, I have taken time to consider this issue already uh, in that I'm looking at my own life and seeing that I'm not all that different from them, my, my ancestors, that is. Uh, am I so special and so unique that I could abandon their traditions and invent a new one? And I may have thought that when I was young and uh, significantly more ar arrogant, <laughs> uh, but now I see myself as not so much different. I've just studied and trained in different fields, but essentially I engage with the natural world. Um, you know, I have a, a biological form much like theirs. I have demands. The world is different. There's different technologies and different pressures, but fundamentally, uh, I'm still enjoying going out in a kayak, going fishing, eating good food, being able to access a forest, right? Um, having a roof over my head. There's very basic human uh, human needs, and I've been raised in this culture that has supplied that. So I'm I'm happy. I'm happy with what has been provided, mm. and thus I'm not rebelling and i'm no longer in sort of sort of hormonal rebellious phase mm. of my life where i'm biased towards rebellion and creation of new systems so perhaps that's that's the conservative you know as you get older you get more conservative sort of trope. that's been my experience uh, but, yeah, I, right <laughs> <laughs> so i yeah okay and uh, christianity is a good example but I don't look at the practice of Christianity for those people who just have a very um, monolithic style of interpretation uh, as being something that needs to be disregarded. I certainly did in my youth. I was like, oh, that, you know, attending a church where this is the way to interpret it is just when indoctrinated with a certain interpretation. And I want to be free to interpret it many ways. Mm -hmm. So I rebelled in a way and invented my own interpretations my own you know becoming the pope of my own religion you know trying to create an atheist christianity there's all sorts of different ways i can rebel against christendom from within it mm -hmm. um, but at the same time i saw the value in practicing the traditions even if i didn't understand them like the congregation the singing together there's the communion like i didn't as a child i didn't understand what it was to be given a bit of fruit juice or wine <laughs> i wasn't given wine <laughs> but a bit of bit of ripe beaner and uh, dry bread. I didn't understand that. Right? And as I get older, um, I decipher from the ritual a meaning. Now, if I had abandoned that and not experienced that, I would not have the memories from which to draw a meaning. So not that I'm particularly inclined towards Christianity, but I certainly was attending churches in, in my childhood. That was the culture of my family, and, and that was the congregation society we engaged with. 
So those are my memories, and that's the information I have to draw upon. Mm -hmm. Now I look at society and traditions there, and I think, well, there are traditions I'm engaging with in our culture and in our society and our, in our nation, um, and I'm performing these rituals or I'm engaging with those rituals uh, as if they are normal. And perhaps I don't like them. And I, and I even, it was, was being a hippie for a while, rebelling against consumerist um, modalities and, and ways of being and trying to change the way that uh, dining or partying, change, change the formalities and the rules around courtship, right? There's all this exploration and rebellion. But I wouldn't only want to be in let's reinvent. I also want to have the option of practicing the traditions or remaining within a bubble that has endured over time mm. to be to have the option of returning to that tradition because you know, winters come there's camping by the river doesn't always work when the frosts are hitting you kind of want to go back to the shelter of something that endures over time in, in my immaturity i hadn't i hadn't the, the capitalistic sense to accumulate the wealth um, to discipline myself in a way to engage with society that set me up to be truly independent. So as I left the nest, so to speak, I danced between recreating a new culture or seeking out another way of living that suited me and my soulful expression, so to speak, and returning to the security of the traditions of my ancestors embodied in my family and mm. the culture that raised me. So there's a security and a strength and a stability and a warmth there, although at times distasteful and stagnant and limiting, bridling, it was provisional and it was persistent. So I think that maintaining the traditions is important. So in terms of that Marxist nationalist spectrum that you've outlined, I definitely value the persistence of tradition. Mm. So whether you understand it or not, because I think that it's nice to have the option to return to that tradition. It's nice to have the uh, option to return to the memories of that tradition, and then you can draw forth some meaning from it. It's almost as if it is a book. The, the enactment of uh, a habit or a way of life over time is like a book that I can read over to interpret in a different way and to burn that down and start afresh is like book burning. I think mm -hmm. it destroys the information that is preserved in the tradition. Mm -hmm. So practice the tradition, even if you don't understand it. Yes. Make it the only way of being. No. So I'm, I guess I'm somewhere in between. Mm. I deeply value our tradition and I want it to stay strong and united and powerful and wise um, the unresolved question for me is can traditions only prosper within the nation within the nation state Well, they could be overthrown from outside. So it makes sense that it would need a container. Mm. Okay, well, that, that sort of sets me on a yes, I like tradition. Uh, yes, I like the nation. Because uh, I have a desire to... Oh, because I have experienced security, I want to maintain the likelihood that I could attain security in the future. And gambling on a new structure... Um, doesn't strike me as wise if it costs the ability to return to a tradition. Mm. So, yeah, I, I guess I'm anti-Marxist in that way. Not anti, but I'm not a Marxist. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. Okay, time for another quote. Okay. The free national state, as we know, comes into being and is maintained through the alliance of diverse tribes and clans, each of which exists thanks to the loyalty of its people to their own tribal leadership and traditions. The nationalist, 
while remaining loyal to the interests and perspectives of his own tribe and clan, nevertheless recognises the immense value that is found in the unity of these diverse tribes and the peace that exists among them. This point of vantage changes his character, making it something quite different from that of the independent tribesmen or clansmen of earlier days. For while the nationalist will at times take sides in the disputes among the tribes that still constitute the nation, he tends to view their claims with a measure of detachment that grows out of his concern for the nation as a whole. In this way, the nationalist learns a moderate scepticism regarding the point of view of his own tribe and is better able to see the merits of the views being advanced by other tribes. He thus becomes more alert to the advantages of an empirical and pragmatic politics that takes the respective views of the different tribes into account, an approach that well, leads, on, on, on. in many cases... Well, hold on, hold on. That's a bit, that's a bit, that's a bit, I mean, I, I like to think that I can absorb a bit of information, but that's a lot of information very quickly. Okay. <sighs> I didn't mean to overwhelm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I appreciate the excitation. <laughs> um, but I'm still digesting the first paragraph. Well, uh, do, do you accept the um, idea that nations come into being from sets of clans and tribes that regard a sort of um, overarching good outcome that they can all orient themselves towards? Or well, I'm searching for an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. Well, places in the world that are quote-unquote still tribal, for whatever that means, um, would be the exception to the rule. So, for example, in Afghanistan, the um, Americans found uh, one of the issues that they had was that there was no unified political entity with which to negotiate with, and their attempt to construct one was immediately undercut. And so they ended up inside the game of balancing the different clans that were always competing with each other and thereby well, that, becoming that becomes complicit. Its own culture. It, it is its own culture, but it's one in which the clans and tribes are constantly competing with each other rather than attempting to form a national spirit out of which to create a nation state. Uh, okay, so there's no shared identity because it's constantly competing. There's no security in, in a group identity. Mm, or... If there is a if there is a group identity, it is shallow, in the sense that we all agree that we're not like those other people, but amongst ourselves, we're far more interested in our own um, family and clan relationships than you know whatever it is that the people on the other side of the hill are up to. Okay, well that's um that's a that's a very useful thought. Mm. Uh, could Compare we could we start that quote again? Oh no! Well, after you after you say what you're saying, so we yep. start that quote again with that in mind. I okay. think it's going to inf inform me a bit better. We'll compare that to the unification of Germany. The... Oh, unification as in when it had all the different uh, barons. Yeah, baronies. baronies and duchies and l tiny little kingdoms and well, you know, it was a it was a mess basically. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, until it was forcibly unified with blood and iron, and then uh, a new nationalism emerged out of that. Blood and iron, isn't that uh, in a German phrase? Yeah. Blut und... Yeah, the Bismarck quote. Yeah, right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, with those in mind, would you mind repeating the excerpt? Yep. Uh, just a slow pace there for me. Okay. The free national state, as we know, comes into being and is maintained through the alliance of diverse tribes and clans, each of which exists thanks to the loyalty of its people to their own tribal leadership and traditions. Mm. So what do we make of that? You think that's right? Yeah. Okay. The nationalist... Okay, well, in that, in that case, it does, it does rule out, as you say, the groups of Kazakh or yeah. you know, the, the warring groups, the basic tribes, yeah. but they haven't managed to create uniformity mm -hmm. and alliance mm -hmm. okay 
The nationalist, while remaining loyal to the interests and perspectives of his own tribe and clan, nevertheless recognises the immense value that is found in the unity of these diverse tribes and the peace that exists among them. The point of value. Okay, so I'm a yeah, I'm a mercantile class in not mercantile. Sorry, I'm a, a merchant class in in Germany in recently formed Germany. And I'm like, oh my god, business is good. Yeah. And I'm happy traveling around all these places because trade is facilitated. I'm not searched at every border. Um, you know, this is booming and this is amazing. And mm. I've never seen anything like it. This is so good. Uh, I'm all for us operating as a whole. Mm. Okay. Yep. Yep. I can see how that would be, that would make him a nationalist. Yep. And there's also a case to be made that nationalisms uh, create nations, not the other way around. So in the in the case of well, Italy, self-reinforcing. yeah, in the case of Italy, first there was an Italian nationalist movement, and then there was an Italy that came out of it, rather than the other way around. That makes sense. Otherwise, you'd just break into, you know, was it the the, the barons and the you know, barony duchy mm. style Germany would just fall apart again mm-hmm. because it, it's the people who are profiting or benefiting from the unity that wish that support it so there must be a benefit to nationalism just Im- implicit in the fact that the nation continues to exist mm. well i think the capacity to trust and uh, having a shared culture leads to natural efficiencies that you know cause you to have extra resources to put towards other ends that seems pretty straightforward nice yeah, it's, yeah very yeah. much so so at, the, at a very base level yeah, in a, in a strictly materialist sense. Yep, that's right. The the nation is beneficial because of the uh, the reduced loss. It's more efficient. There's less there's less internal tax. Oh, hang on, I'm looking at India now. India's got taxation between regions. They don't have their own free trade within their own nation. Yeah, that's right. But it would be better if but, they did. Okay, yeah, it would be better. But and yet you identified them as heavily nationalist or strongly. Yes, that's right. Oh, but so they in, could be even stronger. Yeah, that's right. But keep in mind that the re, that part. I mean, India has been in a nuclear standoff with Pakistan for fifty years, and the reason why Pakistan exists is because India was divided into Hindu and uh, Muslim regions. So. Hindu nationalism is a specifically anti-Islamic nationalism. So the fact that I have to pay a tax to ship something from Uttar Pradesh to Kerala is much less important to me than those people on the other side of the border are threatening to nuke us and we're threatening to nuke them and we live under that condition. For fifty years. Oh, okay. I'm I'm comparing I'm comparing security to uh, economic yep. benefit. Yeah. Okay. So it trumps it. Security trumps it. Of course. Of course. It Nations does. was it? Isn't there a Mearsheimer quote? Is it Mearsheimer? Nations choose security over. Yeah. Do you remember that one? Yep. Absolutely. He said that at the uh, Lowy Institute speech that he gave in Australia. That uh, given the choice between uh, wealth and security people choose uh, security because you yep. can have security Great. and then grow wealth out of it but if you're insecure and wealthy you very quickly get poor awesome yep great thanks thanks for remembering okay i'm ready to continue with the quote okay this point of vantage changes his character and I, let me just say i think this is where this quote gets interesting this line making it something quite different from that of the independent tribesmen or clansmen of earlier days. For while the nationalist will at times take sides in the disputes among the tribes that still constitute the nation, he tends to view their claims with a measure of detachment that grows out of his concern for the nation as a whole. In this way, the nationalist learns a moderate scepticism regarding the point of view of his own tribe and is better able to see the merits of the views being advanced by other tribes, he thus becomes more alert to the advantages of an empirical and pragmatic politics that takes the respective views of the different tribes into account, an approach that leads, in many cases, to a better understanding of the good of the nation than what the perspective of any one tribe can afford. 
What a strong argument. Mm. That's fantastic. Okay, so so rather than me being a tribe within my nation, um, wanting my nation to represent my tribe, by identifying the strength of the unity that forms the nation, I then go, well, the strength of the, that is the unity of these tribes into a nation um, is so strong, uh, and it come, that strength comes from the unity of the tribes. I'm now going to look at these other tribes and go, what are they doing and what are they contributing to the nation? How can I support them to be stronger mm. so that we are all stronger? Mm-hmm. And thus, actually, being a nationalist is more inclusive yeah, so- of other tribal opinions exactly so over the long periods over the time of um, national unification the perspective of the individuals changes from what's good for my family to what's good to for the whole group the nation to what's good for everyone inside the nation and in that transformation uh, man changes from a political animal in which he's in constant conflict with his neighbors to a political animal that considers the upsides for the plural first person the we the the usness of the society that they ex- that he exists within and that's a mo- uh, and nice. i would argue that's a moral development so his only rights In this way, the nationalist learns a moderate scepticism regarding the point of view of his own tribe and is better able to see the merits of the views being advanced by other tribes. He thus becomes more alert to the advantages of an empirical and pragmatic politics that takes the respective views of the different tribes into account, an approach that leads in many cases to a better understanding of the good of the nation than what the perspective of any one tribe can afford. And if you remember, you had pointed out that... um, It was in some sense, I don't know what the word you used was, not cosmopolitan, uh, more pluralistic. Mm. I wish I used that word. Yeah, so <laughs> so in that sense, the nationalist in this context is more pluralistic uh, because it, he accepts the uh, variety of um, internal worlds by that is shared Absolutely. by his nation fellows. And has only specifically it serves, says, the, serves the strength of his nation to absolutely. have the other tribes that even though they're different and potentially competing to have them strong serves the strength of the nation. Yeah, and he, and has only specifically says it's entirely possible for the nation to bring in new tribes and new clans over time. This is not just a one-off event, right? And your example was Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Nice strength. Mm. As we move beyond that, it it raises concerns in me about just, it it brings it back to, uh, do we want to see ourselves as different from um, other areas? But that's that Marxist argument returning. That's that I identify with the classes of people from other nations as being the same as me. Mm. And that separating myself from them is an elitist. Well... At face value, the cosmopolitan Mm -hmm. approach appears to be more moral because it takes the standpoint of, look, all people are of equal value and uh, we should acknowledge um, the contributions of everyone towards a world that uh, lives in peace together and differences are respected, but they don't divide us. And that, as a selling pitch, that's pretty hot. Yeah. But when the outcome of the attempt to apply that approach is eternal wars of intervention in other people's countries for the purpose of trying to bring them around to um, your moral perspective, you know, what's promised and what's delivered is so Mm -hmm. different that I think it's absolutely valid to reconsider nationalism. Um, as his only does because it can't be denied that the history of humanity is one in which people um, hold the concerns of their fellow nation dwellers higher than their though than the concerns of strangers or well, are they can't they be mutually exclusive can't you say that 
by having these values, we are inclined towards uh, the liberalisation agenda in other states. Uh, can't you say it's more of an inclination than it necessitates it? Um... Well, we only have one recent example, and that is the uh, liberal interventionist wing of the American foreign policy elite. That was in power through the early two th uh, early two thousands. Okay, so let's consider some other uh, points that Hazoni makes. Um. Let me give you some quotes and uh, you'll quickly get a sense of the approach that he's taking. He says, If there is anything to be learned from these states, it is that the overwhelming dominance of a single nationality within a given state allows for the growth of free institutions, including individual rights and liberties, that an internally divided state, that is a non-national state, cannot in general either develop or maintain. So he's explicitly endorsing uh, having a central ethnos inside the nation state, and I would expect that that uh, I would expect that to be troubling for people. Well, is it ethnos, or is it just um, an agreed upon notion of a state among tribes? Uh, no, he's quite specific that it is uh, ethnos. Right. Yeah. Because it allows for certain institutions, and those institutions give advantage. Yeah. Competitive advantage. Yeah. What are the institutions? Well, at, uh, according to the the institutions arise according to the nature of the tradition. So they represent the internal world of the culture that uh, flavors the or the, or that the arises out of the ethnos. So he says, uh, and I quote. What is needed for the establishment of a stable and free state is a majority nation whose cultural dominance is plain and unquestioned. And well, because it stops internal weakness, because the internal weakness is something to be exploited by external bodies. Yeah, necessarily. Well, what's that quote? Mm. A house divided against itself cannot stand, right? Right. And he even goes further and says, the non-national state inevitably tilts towards a despotic regime. Mm. Yeah. And I interpret this as being a strong form of his argument, right? That uh, previous attempts to create... I mean, look at the United States. There's an argument at the moment between whether or not the uh, central ethnos is really important to the United States as an Enlightenment project, or whether or not the United States is an idea and therefore can um, sustain any ethnic shift within it. But if the ethnos and the idea are interlinked and the idea emerges from the ethnos, then even if it is only an idea, Still, it is dependent on the ethnos. Interesting. That's as this is still up for debate, isn't it? So my own personal bias isn't really going to carry carry any weight in, that, in this regard. <laughs> okay. Well, it is a live issue in the United States, and there's plenty of adherence on every side of it. Hmm. Okay, a house divided amongst himself will mm. no longer stand, so to speak, or if I lose the exact quote. It makes sense to me. That's one of the uh, advantages. Now, I still don't know what the institutions are, and I'm trying to think of an example now. Um, what is it? Um, in, a, in the religious structure, uh, the caliphate, they have, like, what's it? There's well, a more efficient advantage to their legal structure? Well... In the sense that the uh, institutions arise uh, independently from the culture inside um, each nation state, they're in, uh, they're all different from, different from each other. There's no there's no necessarily comparing across boundaries that is viable. Um, 
but we could say that inside the Anglosphere two variants of uh, or two institutional variants are the Westminster system of government in the UK and the more Republican form of government in the United States and the lack of those structures in other cultures yeah whereas if they don't, you compare, they don't share the same idea or ethos yeah, yeah absolutely right um, mm. so it's an it, and it's not impossible as we mentioned previously the Indian state system um, inherits some of the uh, factors of the Westminster system whereas if you compare it to the Iranian uh, approach to governance they they have a really heavy you know uh, bureaucratic system but it's still dictated to from a single voice on high okay uh when you just to get some further clarity on that with regards to the the the, the boundary of ethnos uh, you started this podcast with uh, the definition of mm -hmm. the three dimensions mm -hmm. of the nation yep okay and they were or do we want to go over them again just nation state and ethnos the nation being the people the state being the bureaucratic mechanism for governance and the uh, ethnos being the kind of ethnic identity of the people of the state okay so if i can relate that in to this advantage the ethnic identity mm. that seems quite blurry it's hard to pin down and part of the reason that it's hard to pin down is because it's tense to talk about because it's um uh, come into disrepute due to historical factors hmm oh it's one of those no-go dangerous topics it is political suicide topic yeah but i'm not here to play safe so mm -hmm. we can deal with it well i'm so brazen sometimes and it's impossible for me to play safe um <laughs> <laughs> right okay so that's tying in uh say for example if you're going to look at the anglo-american um, ethnicity if i can be so uh, brazen sure um, uh, you're looking at the history of that group and how uh, their culture that they brought over from europe and they then fought for their independence and they shifted and then they created this new identity the, was it the anglo-american mm. um, from their own revolution uh, and that's fine because that can be an identity and it actually is inclusive of uh, different blood history as well because of course the American uh, the African Americans fought in the Civil War and to a large extent uh, united mm. in that identity but then I can see right now 2020 there's that conflict around exactly that so okay very hairy yeah so let's consider two historical examples um in france it's possible to become a citizen by what they call right of spilled blood where you join the foreign legion fight for the french nation and then become a citizen or at least the that used to be the case and another example is the uh, the shambles that we call the european union part of the reason why that has continued to fail is that it has not constructed a unified european identity because people who live inside the nation states uh, that are subject to is that too strong a way word to um the european union uh refuse to sacrifice their national identities uh to the larger whole right right and it's i get the same problem the same problem with the immigration issue of those nations and that the immigrants come in such numbers and populate areas all from the same location and thus carry the identity of their origin nation rather than adopting and adapting to the nation that they arrive in mm. or and not even creating a mixed model right right yeah super states is that what they are yeah supranational organizations is what they're commonly termed supra okay. yeah oh, if we're talking about the european union that is um 
I don't know what the name is for um, these sort of independent cultural zones within a host nation. Mm. Yeah. Well, just having them and having oh, this is this is where it gets into the failure of multiculturalism, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's right. Okay. Well, so, I think we'll be revisiting that. Do you want to continue with the um, the quote and analysis? Yeah. And we'll and we'll tie the multicultural failure into it. Well. Or is there something else you need to cover? I'm just thinking about whether it's worthwhile to consider cosmopolitanism as the root of multiculturalism. The birthplace of cosmopolitanism was in uh, elite European society where people who had the free time and the money to travel across Europe to various places regarded it as sophisticated to be you know, fluent in multiple languages and have experience in different major cities and that being the and that cosmopolitanism being the um, root of the expansion into uh, the enlightenment ideal of the equality of man and from there into and, and that becoming the uh, ethical validation required to institute or to attempt um, multiculturalism and we have a variety of uh, multiculturalist approaches in the United States they have what they call the melting pot where everybody comes together and becomes Americans together uh, we have the Chinese model where you are which is uh, the model of not multiculturalism, right? The ethnic <coughs> and national identities are the same and cannot be altered. You have the Canadian model of uh, what used to be called the mosaic culture, where people harmoniously live together as a nation inside cultural spheres that are uh, independent and understanding of each other and not imposing on each other. So you have a French mm. cultural sphere, an uh, English cultural sphere, an indigenous cultural sphere, and they all participate in the nation, theoretically, har and, harmoniously. Well, now you'd end up with um, sort of Islamic areas and Chinese areas. Mm, that's right. Um, Turkish areas, Indian areas, as you do in all major cities now. Yeah, that's right. And... You know, major cities have always been trade hubs and therefore had kind of these kind of cultural things. But an interesting yeah, thing that has which happened. Which is nice. Actually. I like it about cities, to be honest. I can go to different areas yeah. and enjoy a, a slice of other cultures. Yeah. But that, but the, hold on a second. But that's a multicultural city that ends up not being multicultural. It ends up turning into this mosaic. Exactly right. So, uh, so here's my question Is it a failure of multiculturalism? Or is it a su success of multiculturalism for a city to have lots of small, bounded national, or sorry, not national, cultural identities within it, right? Is the success of multiculturalism when all of the ethnicities in a city join into a single culture, or is the success that they live together harmoniously whilst being independently m maintaining their own identities? Well, given that both the melting pot and the mosaic are both forms of multiculturalism, um, turning from a melting pot into a mosaic is not a failure of the overarching umbrella. Um, the failure would be the conflict that occurs, the lack of peace between the groups, the tiles and the mosaic, so to speak. Mm. So I think the... Um, the fracturing or the, the splintering into power groups that then vie in conflict with each other with violence um, is the fact is indicative of the failure. Mm. And to the degree that in the current age, the primary political attack vector for different. Um, competing polities 
is one of trying to insert division into a society in order to fracture it into smaller political identities so that it's impossible for an imposing nation state to operate as a complete and whole unit one could make the claim that multiculturalism is a weakness in that context because it allows the opportunity for division you could also make a claim that it's a strength that it's um and yeah i'm not sure how one would go about claiming that it's a strength but i'm sure there's more creative people than me will come up with an argument to support it well if you identify with multiculturalism then you can use it to rise above the um disharmonic effect of the occasional violence between groups Mm. so so you allow it to happen and you know you come to peace quicker because of the strength of the identity and also you have um the melting pot of all the different ideas so the 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 idea would be with uh, the western value of synthesizing new discoveries out of the um you know dialogue the dialogical ethic is facilitating the exchange mm. um, it creates new technologies new social technologies so there is an advantage yeah that's right one of the advantages is that the all of the participating cultures are potential so- sources of resources for overcoming challenges and if one of those challenges is opposing states attempting to sow division within your nation state perhaps there's viable cultural forms that can be drawn from multiple sources in order to help sew the nation state together as a multicultural but coherent entity yeah i would say yes that is true but in my own leaning is that is outweighed by the human tendency to have a bias towards the uh what's it the it's in times of stress humans are biased towards the faces that are like their own because of the efficiency and pace at which they can interpret the uh the, the data or the, you know they can understand how dangerous a person is by looking at their face because they can read more into the face because it's a face that they're used to mm. so i think that in here and, and the, the face that we're most used to is our own mm. and, and particularly our blood family that we're raised with so um given that yeah given that under stress so the multicultural strength breaks down in times of great great stress yeah i think it's plausible to claim that a multicultural society will fracture earlier than an ethno-nationalist society um under pressure yes so i can see that i can see that as an argument or an explanation for what's happening in America mm-hmm. with the current civil conflicts, and that there is a great stress over there. They, well, I guess there's a stress here. I mean, I'm coming from New Zealand where there's a lot less stress here. Um, but, you know, the where's the safety net when you start falling out the bottom? If you lose your job, if you have debts, you know, if you get, if you do something wrong and then you can't, you can't get out of the hole, mm. there's a lot more pressure. And I've, spoken to americans and they seem to share that opinion and i'm coming from outside having not traveled through america but, and i can look at other countries that would be the same you know, in which countries in which okay here we go here's an example here's a, a thought experiment in which multicultural nations is there less stress on the multicultural melting pot or mosaic than there is in new zealand australia yeah i don't know one of the really interesting things that happened in our country was the swift was the switch from a bicultural society to a multicultural society which seemed to occur without really any discussion or at least not any that i was aware of i don't know if you remember but um a while ago especially in the as recently as the 80s um new zealand was considered a bicultural society which is to say the colonialist europeans and the indigenous maoris were both citizens of the queen and therefore equal inheritors of the 
nation state and to mm. absolute. I was taught that at the end of the nineties. Yeah. Yep. And that has disappeared, and now we are encouraged to consider ourselves as a multicultural society. Fair enough. There's been a lot of immigration, mm. and there will continue to be if we don't replace ourselves. Yeah. Okay, so maybe that's a failed thought experiment because there aren't really. Okay, well, we'll look at Europe then. Yeah. Um, uh, Nordic nations. Okay. Uh, would you say that Finland is multicultural? No. I would. I would say that Finland aspires towards multiculturalism, but I, they're, but they're not multicultural. It's a Finnish society. So it's it's about the proportion of the dominant ethnos. Well, rather than me making a claim, let's examine some of the claims that could be made. Okay. You could say that a society which has an overwhelmingly dominant ethnos um, is one in which the uh, multiculturalism is just not apparent, independent of the aspirations of the elites within that society. It seems like a pretty strong one. I'll just assume that myself as a first impulse. You're saying that there's another option? Leaving it open the potential that there's another one. Hmm. There must be. We can well, invent one now. Yeah, what other, well, what other um, arguments or approaches could we have? I mean, do we have evidence of multi-ethnic societies that are completely nationally coherent? I'm thinking of uh, societies like Brazil, which uh, have had an extremely long tradition of multi-ethnicity, but I have no idea whether or not Bra Brazilians regard themselves as um, primarily inhabitants of the state of Brazil <laughs> ahead of their own ethnicity or not. Right. What about the Czech Republic? I I don't know anything about it. With the uh, with the with the gypsies. Well, the history of European um, bigotry towards the gypsies is a long one. And enduring. Absolutely. It hasn't gone anywhere, as far as I'm aware. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so their identity, they see themselves as... Well, gypsies see themselves as part of it and, and continue to function as part of it, but, I'm, but it's dysfunction. What, what's the it in that sentence? Because surely you can't mean that gypsies see themselves as part of the nation states that they inherit, right? Uh, that they inhabit, right? Well, I can't speak for gypsies, uh, but I can imagine that there are uh, gypsies in in the in the Czech Republic that see themselves as Czech citizens and a part of the Czech nation and wanting to integrate, but also wanting to retain their own culture and ethnicity or well, identity well this is speculation uh, now yeah the speculation that's right and then yeah. i can also speculate that the czech will um, may re rebel against that because you're saying that the bigotry is endemic okay well that's that's not something i can explore yeah so the answer is no i've just scraped the barrel and come come out wanting so then I suppose that being the case, we have to accept Hazoni's um, argument that in order for a nation state to remain um, free and uh, non-despotic, it has to have a uh, undisputed central culture, culture and ethnos. Is that where we've arrived at? Because that's not an argument that I imagine many people would like to no, make it, in public. Oof. I, well, no, he said it was the inclination, the tendency towards despotism, right? He didn't say it wasn't um, absolute. Um, his, I quote, What is needed for the establishment of a stable and free state is a majority nation whose cultural dominance is plain and unquestioned.
Wow. He goes further. And against which resistance appears to be futile. Such a majority nation is strong enough not to fear challenges from national minorities and so is able to grant them rights and liberties without damaging the internal integrity of the state. Similarly, the national minorities that stand against such a national majority are themselves largely reluctant to engage in confrontations that they know they cannot win. For the most part, they therefore assimilate themselves into the system of expectations established by the constitutional and religious culture of the majority nation, learning its language and resorting to violence only on rare occasions. This has been the case in the most successful national states, such as Britain, America, France and other countries in Europe, in addition to national states such as Australia, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Turkey, India and Israel. In each case, the overwhelming dominance of a single majority nation has produced states that are dramatically more stable, prosperous and tolerant than neighbouring states that have not been constituted as national states. Well, it puts out a serious concern that if that is compromised, then the inclination towards despotism is strong. It's an incredible... Yeah... There's a big risk to allowing a culture to um, dilute the dominance of one ethnicity. This is what he's proposing. This is what's dangerous to say. The big risk to allowing the dilution of the dominance of one ethnicity uh, and then resulting in some sort of ethnic, internal ethnic conflict and then the rise of despotism. Um, well, is it implying that that's what the collapse of sort of the modern multicultural cities would become? despotic uh i don't know if it implies that or not but i um because i'm not interested in really discussing like the news i'd like to keep it at a theory at a high theoretical level if possible um sure but i think if i if i extend beyond what hazoni argues it seems to me that it leads to a place where if a minority grows inside a majority ethnic state to such a degree that it starts to balance the the majority, right? As it approaches the fifty percent mm -hmm. mark, you end up with yeah. two national identities side by side with independent cultural characteristics, and that all of the political tensions point towards the division of the state into two separate new nation states that have national cultures and that those become the new stable forms. So, But they share space. Yes, but then they just draw a new boundary bef between them and say, we are no longer one state, we are now two states. As an example, consider Yugoslavia in the 90s. After the death of Tito, uh, the internal tensions of the 11 different ethno-linguistic religio religious groups in Yugoslavia fell into uh, through warfare fell into the separate um, states that they now are and all of them have split along uh, those ethnic linguistic and cultural lines and just suffer a brief period of migration uh, yeah not just migration but also war and ethnic cleansing ethnic cleansing Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, that was left out of the last summary, wasn't it? Yeah. Despotic, he says. Hmm. Yeah, he um, he appears to be arguing that the um, central ethnos will uh, accept more and more despotic impositions as it is challenged by a growing minority ethnos. Makes sense. Yeah, it's troubling though. What if there was a, a new identity, a new, um, well, just like a communal agreement, like this multicultural and multiculturalism vision? God, it would have to it'd be the advent of a new technology where the people see themselves as all one, they're all plugged into some computer. I'm just turning into sci-fi to try and Im imagine an exception. 
Mm. Well, if we don't have an example of a post-racial society, then we have to look to the future in order to find possibilities. Uh, globalism. Um, you know, the access to the internet, information age, education. What do you remember in the 90s or the um, techno-utopian like the, at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, the wave of techno-utopian kind of uh, effulgent optimism that came out around the internet. Do you remember the stories that we used to tell ourselves about how inevitably the sharing of information was going to unify the world into a single coherent culture in which everybody shared um, all of the kind of best parts of everybody's independent inventions? And Timothy Leary, in fact, came out with a book claiming that the internet was going to become the Earth's mind. And I what still happened, have the hope. What happened still to have that? that? Does anybody still hold on to that, though? Like, it, when one looks at the way that social media is used these days, it's certainly it's a tool of division, not unity, right? Well, I can't use Facebook anymore. Ugh. I'm just greeted with hostility. Yeah, I oh, know, it's horrible. So that... Still possible, still plausible. Um, so... However, I think with hardship, we are unable to, um, we're unable to comprehend or engage in such peaceful manners. I think it comes down to stress. I think there's a biological barrier. But we can only have those utopian visions when we have the liberty of, of contemplative thought space the privilege so to speak yeah my concern is that that utopianism arises not only when um, people are liberated from the impositions of um, the hard form of uh, necessity imposing it into their lives but actually liberated from consideration of the real world at all okay well that ties into my th theory on stress and that uh, the stress keeps you bound to the world and so you just you can't be liberated from it to dream mm, well you can't be you can't ignore imp material impositions on your life right i think there's also been an issue around uh, comfort in that the proliferation of comfort technologies has not been as pervasive as we are told. You know, people would talk about, oh, we're so comfortable, complacent. I've certainly heard this a lot uh, in social circles and on media. Um, you know, we have all these comfort technologies, but those comfort technologies didn't really liberate us. They seem to be just substitutes for real progression, pampering instead of progress well it seems to me that it accepts an idea of authenticity that I'm, I'm not totally comfortable with um in this critique what is progress that is not pampering um Pampering seems nice. I like the idea of things being nicer and softer and, and more delicate, but I have a tendency in, in my own life to make a mountain out of a molehill. Even in a relatively good situation, I can get mildly upset about a small hindrance. Hmm. It was, it's as if my neurobiology will still react to it as if it is something greater, simply because it is some negative novelty and I just turn that into something more significant than it really is and that's an impulse I guess and I can transcend that but I do notice it in my own experience and I think that the more pampering you get it, it just changes the plane on which your hills arise but mm. you still turn them into mountains are you familiar with the term hedonic treadmill <laughs> seems self-explanatory but please elaborate <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds like, yeah. like yeah. 
this idea that the better things get the easier it is to get used to them and then uh you just immediately absorb all progress and it it becomes every day instantly right Uh, and then in which case the issue becomes and this is where the marxists come back in the issue becomes the disparity because it's not about it's not about poverty and lack of pampering that causes uh, crime but rather the adjacent disparity or proximity to disparity well given that we're social animals we probably spend all of our time comparing ourselves to our the people that we're exposed to right well i don't want to put that on myself but it does seem like that is a (laughs) major trend okay so we want so in order to mitigate that tendency then would want to make it so that within your proximity uh, the wealth is relatively equivalent but that seems to be sliding into a marxist idea unless you can have a nation built around that so maybe actually a marxist nation becomes very strong well i can't think of any examples of strong marxist nations I can only recall the horrors of their attempts. Yeah. The problem is that with um, progress in the hedonic treadmill and all of that is there appears to be a paradox, which is that because wealth is uh, distributed overwhelmingly towards one end, um, and as wealth grows in a society, inevitably also inequality grows. So... If, are we in a paradox where uh, satisfaction is always the cost of wealth? Uh, I think satisfaction is never the reward from wealth. I think that's what we're being shown. Hmm an implied reward but it's an illusion yeah that's what the treadmill concepts alluding to so our dissatisfaction with life is just a mammalian inheritance that is always going to remain until we decide to medicate it away or find some other mechanical solution or until we are only exposed to people with equivalent conditions which binds us to the Marxist ideal yeah Um, I talked to a guy who grew up in a kibbutz in Israel um, where everybody what they received was extremely strictly measured uh, for equality and I asked him what it was like and he said that almost all of the conversations that his parents had with other members of the kibbutz were who got more than somebody else and how unfair it was Ooh. yeah okay well, imagine for imagine an alternate when people who uh, earn by rights of their own decisions in life and there are you know rewarded merit yeah, I'm not saying that meritocracy is the solution necessarily, um, but you know if you work hard and you and you are intelligent in how you deploy that work or apply it, then you're rewarded with um, accruing capital, and then you use that to live near to people who did the same. So you start dividing society divides by by wealth right and so you just have like a a proximity you're not allowed to have a house worth this because you're too close to houses worth that Uh, is the economy of first world nations not already a sorting mechanism that fulfills that role though 
it seems to me that people's exposure to extreme wealth and extreme poverty um, is entirely through mediated means. Right, well, okay, well, so we look at Brazil and the proximity of a, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not saying this world for Brazil, yeah. um, proximity between a favela and uh, a luxury apartment complex. Uh, right, are they, overlooking are they close or far? Other. I don't know. They're right next to each other. There's a boundary with a bunch of fancy tennis courts that are empty. Now, the other side, there's 100,000 people living in slums. Mm. Okay, um, so extremely high crime because of the proximity of the disparity and the mm -hmm. apparent nature of it. Um, so in the developed or first world nations, there seems to be a shift as in the people who have a lot of wealth do move somewhere else. Like right now myself, I'm not surrounded by mansions. So I never consider the wealth disparity between myself and the mansion dwellers. Mm. But I do notice an impulse in myself uh, to compare myself uh, when I go to the areas where those mansions are. So it's as if there's something that's happened in the developed world that has kept the peace by enabling the, the distancing. And it doesn't fully make sense because we have um, a property value uh, initiative, really, where we're trying to increase the value of our property because that's how we work on the mortgage ladder or the, the property ladder. So you want somebody wealthy to move in next to you and build a mansion so that your place is more desirable for another person to come and build a mansion next to them. So you you, you want that. Whereas I'm thinking maybe a way to regulate it further would be to say you can't build a really flash place next to these other places. You have to build in the approximate value cap. Uh, come on now. I can't believe that you're... Um seriously uh, arguing for a centrally administered um, economy. Oh, I can argue for it. It doesn't mean... I'm just trying to explore whether that could be a, a viable improvement. As an alternate... Um, yeah, okay. As an alternate for Marxism, it would be better. But I'm pretty sure it's not going to satisfy some people who are like, hey, I own this land. This is up on this beautiful hill. I've got a good view. I don't give a stuff what my neighbors have. I want that. Mm. I should be free to get that. And I'm not going to get in the way of that. That sounds, that's liberty. So, <laughs> hmm. Well, I think the takeaway um, for this segment of our conversation for me is that uh, nations are always vying internally to maintain their own stability against a constant entropic um, uh, negotiation. Yes. Yeah. So in order for nations to continue, they need to have resolution mechanisms which uh, resolve or overcome or displace the uh, constant sources of Stress. Yeah, these sort of internal division stresses. In which case, to return to the multi-ethnic society, what mm -hmm. is the mechanism that the nation state has to resolve um, inter-ethnic strife? Uh, redistribution is the one that comes to mind immediately, but... It could just as, but redistribution can just as easily be a source of ethnic strife as what as a uh, pacifier. And it sounds like, from Hazoni's perspective, that there are there are no effective mechanisms. Or no, that's incorrect. There are mechanisms that are effective inside a society that has a major ethnos to which minor ethnoses accept the cultural dominance yes but there are but there are no uh, conversely um nation state mechanisms capable of resolving inter-ethnic violence once 
the majority ethnos loses its majority status and instead the ethnicities are equally sized across the society. Hmm. Yep, okay, I hear the argument and it makes perfect sense. And I'm just finding myself panicking and desperately searching my imagination for ways to reduce the stress in that society so that so that ethnic cleansing doesn't repeat it. <laughs> well, one of the interesting outcomes um, from the uh, Yugoslav experience is the setting up of what they call truth and Recon reconciliation commissions. So in post-ethnic cleansing states, um, you get organizations like the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe that um, come into countries and set up these truth and reconciliation commissions where uh, both perpetrators and victims of ethnic cleansing tell the truth about the experiences that they had in those times and then uh, at attempt some variety of reconciliation. Now the reason why I reach for that example is because ethnic cleansing I think is probably the strongest form of uh, inter-ethnic violence. So what is the more moderate form of uh, truth and reconciliation commission? Is it just the production of cultural values that um, perpetrate a uh, sorry perpetrate is the wrong word that create a um, narrative of national unity and uh, cooperative utility between ethnicities in which case I'm essentially arguing for uh, a national propaganda of ethnic unity yeah yeah, and uh, I was I was thinking, um, sort of, the media. Well, I was thinking soap operas, like conventional soap operas. You start adjusting the soap operas so that they adopt the other cultural narratives and intertwine them, and it turns into a, um, a like a propaganda wing in itself, in a way, mm. in that you're actually introducing and transforming your culture progressively through through drama, through through an expansion of the individual's relationship matrix and social comprehension. It depends on uh, the consumption rate of that media, though. That makes me extremely queasy. <laughs> you sit down, sit down and watch your uh, Shorten Street yeah. five nights a week yeah. and just watch it slowly become, you know, maybe they start doing Chinatown episodes and... And, uh, you know, maybe now the, the lead character, the f top three lead characters are Māori and Indian. Um, who knows how it actually evolves. And that starts to adjust the consciousness of society. And so it's as if the soap operas are a story of that evolution. So you could probably actually do a study on how the narrative arcs or the cultural representations evolve over time. Mm. and look at Short Street as an example well, maybe. and that's actually the softest way to do it two problems one, right. free and open societies can't have state funded propaganda shifting the cultural world of the people that live within it because that's abusive and two, I'm sceptical that such propaganda could be successful even if it was trite unless it was based upon a general a, a, a genuine inter-ethnic gratitude anyway well it could be a, a, a genuine graduation into a new state but if it's all of a sudden I don't see how it would work uh, if it was rapid it depends on the pace of the society's oh sorry of the ethnic composition transformation or evolution mm. but that I think is the, is the major factor because I imagine that even with the free open society you're going to have interests in capturing the market share and so you're going to want to capture as much as you can. So maybe rather than fracturing into, here's a show for that culture, here's, here's a, um, here's Moldy TV, and here's, um, here's Pioneer Redneck 
TV, um, rather trying to create a shared one. But I don't see when we've got so many options and we're going to select our own, that's going to be tricky. Oh, well, it's a fantasy. Mm. God, I'm hopeful. I'm so hopeful. <laughs> I don't feel like we've successfully argued our way out of Hazoni's dilemma, though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a free and open society, so you can't make people watch it. That's right. And so how do you mitigate their own bias towards what they like? People, people. I mean, Facebook's showing us people like their reality tunnels. Yeah. Or people like their little mirrors. Mm. Well, to the degree that a Echo society chambers. is a self rehypnotization already anyway, Um. Yeah, all social media done, has done is, a, is given us more tools to narrow those visions and increase okay. their number. So overall, it's a, a less shared culture. Well, you can't be a free society and forcibly break people's echo chambers. No. Well, I don't have an argument against what Hazoni is saying there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so be it resolved, Yoram Hazoni's nationalism is correct. Mm. Okay. Is that where we're at? Was it, oh, is that the end of your quote list? You want to uh, top it off with one, one more then? Oh yeah, maybe I'll give you a little slice of something from the conclusion, eh? Yeah, nice. It is said that when God calls Abraham, he tells him that he will make of you a great nation, and in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. Yet nowhere are the patriarchs offered an empire over the earth, only a kingdom over Israel. The other nations that will one day find their way to God and his teachings will do so in their own time and according to their own understanding. Each nation judges in accordance with a perspective that is its own. There is no human being and no nation that can claim to have captured the entire truth for all the others. This mosaic view is diametrically opposed to that offered by Kant's supposedly enlightened imperialism, which asserts that moral maturity arrives with the renunciation of a national independence and the embrace of a single universal empire. But there is no moral maturity in the yearning for a benevolent empire to rule the earth and take care of us, judging for us and enforcing its judgments upon us. It is in fact nothing but a plea to return to the dependency of childhood when our parents took care of us and judged for us in all important matters. True moral maturity is attained only when we stand on our own feet, learning to govern ourselves and defend ourselves without needlessly harming those around us, and where possible also extending assistance to neighbours and friends. And the same is true for nations, which reach a genuine moral maturity when they can live in freedom and determine their own course benefiting others where this is feasible, yet with no aspirations to impose their rule and laws on other nations by force. Wishing to attain maturity, we should shoulder the burdens of national freedom and independence that we have received as an inheritance from our forefathers. Let us do everything in our power to ensure that this precious gift is still intact when the time comes to pass this national freedom on to our children. It's beautiful. Hmm. It definitely stirs a few last thoughts. It makes me think of the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. And it also makes me think of uh, population migrations to enable um, sort of dominant ethnicities to retain their nations. Mm and how difficult and problematic that would be. And it leads me to imagine the um, progressive rise, or basically the change of dominant ethnic groups through what's happening with uh, reproductive rates in the world mm. and immigration. Mm. So that is a, a big kettle of fish. The one remaining issue for me is that... Um Hazoni's nationalism doesn't solve Mearsheimer's dilemma. Nations, whether nationalist or multi-ethnic, 
are still caught in the bind of not being able to verify other states' intentions, having some offensive capability, and there being no central authority in the world, and therefore innately being in competition with each other. So, well, I liked has only painted a nice picture of uh, nations all getting along and, and, and this beautiful, hopeful vision of me being able to travel around the world and experience unique cultures in mm. different places. So I like I, that. Yeah. Well, I'm left accepting Hazoni's argument that nationalism is a necessary part of the nation state, but not accepting his vision of a peaceful future between nations. That is the part where the argument falls down for me. Well, I don't know if he was projecting that that's likely. I think he's putting forward a hope, a hopeful vision. Mm. You're yeah, seeing it as unlikely. Right, so am I a nationalist? That was my question at the start of this. Ah, so, study yesterday's. W, are you a nationalist? <sighs> I aspire to be because I like the idea of my actions and existence contributing to the stability and the strength of the nation that forms the bubble in which I am free to engage with and explore the meaning of traditions and invent my own. So I want, I want to contribute to what is clearly a beneficial advantage the official advantage of um, of nationalism well, I, I favor my state I'm happy to be here I like what it grants me in terms of the privileges and the lifestyle I get to enjoy here I like my freedoms um, and I want the nation to be stronger um, I like the idea of my support of the nation making uh, making me more likely to be inclusive of um, other ethnicities within my nation so and I'm part of the dominant ethnic group currently mm -hmm. the primary okay good so should we leave it off there then yeah nice one thanks okay. for your time yeah Lovely. likewise